Okay, so what we're going to do this week is look at Renaissance and Reformation historiography. Um, I've written Val and Machiavelli here because these are the two historians that you've read, and I'm not going to talk about their details, but what I do want to do is just give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on during this time period in terms of the writing of history. <clears throat> so in terms of the word Renaissance, so Renaissance literally means rebirth. And let me um, write on the screen here. So re means again. And nascence, this is where we get the word natal from. So it literally means um, being born again or a rebirth. <clears throat> and in this case, what it means is a rebirth of Greek um, and Roman ideals. And what, what's really happening here is that the West, European... Um, West lost uh, the Greek and Roman classical works, at least quite a few of them. Now, just south in Spain and, of course, south of this area and to the east, um, you've got Muslim-controlled areas. And it tur turns out that the Muslims actually saved a lot of these Greek and Roman texts. So what you have are European scholars contacting Muslim scholars and then discovering these new texts. And that's what this rebirth is. And not so surprising, what you find is that in terms of the writing of history and lots of other things, um, many of the, uh, the historians that you've read um, come into play again. So this is especially the case with Livy and Sallus. And we didn't read Tacitus. He was a Roman senator uh, who wrote another history. So uh, histories started to be written along the same classical um, formats that we've already talked about. Uh, what's really interesting about this, this time period is that the focus of history, because of the classical push, um, it moves away from history of the church. So we looked at a few Christian historians. Um, a lot of the, the histories between the time of Eusebius and up to this period were really church, church histories. Um, the focus on the classical world again, world again in the period of the Renaissance uh, moves the focus to secular issues. Um, you also see, especially in Italy, where the Renaissance got to start, um, interested in their own city-states. So in this period, there, there was no country of Italy. It was a series of city-states. And they become much more interested in their own history, primarily because, of course, in Italy, this is where the Roman Empire was. So. The Italians are really interested in how the Romans made their empire so great so they could become great again. Another movement that started during the Renaissance was something called the humanism movement. And as I put up here on the slide, this is really a move towards centering on the individual and not necessarily the state or the church. Um, another thing that um, humanism did, and I put up here, is it began to wear away that the control of the church, the Catholic church here and focused on these ancient texts and ancient lives and so on. So it's actually a really interesting thing that started happening during the Renaissance. And many of the historians, or I should say the people who are writing history, um, become educated using the classical models, meaning they started to learn Greek um, in particular, uh, Latin. A lot, of the, a lot of the educated people had known Latin already, especially if they were associated with the church. But they become educated in the classical way, and of course they start writing about secular issues. Um, interesting thing that happened during this period is of course in Italy, um, Italians during the Renaissance were, were surrounded by um, archeological remains from the Romans. And with this new interest on Roman history came a new interest on archeology. span And you start to see historians use archeology span in their histories for the first time. I do want to mention here um, that you don't have people who, um, who their job was as a historian. So you don't have that quite yet. Um, history was involved in lots of other disciplines. So the main degree that you'd want to get during the Renaissance Reformation period would be a doctorate in theology or degree in theology. Um, and with that, you would have to know New Testament history, Old Testament history. Um, another degree you could get was to be a lawyer. Um, to know law, you had to know um, ancient history. So you learned history through the discipline that you were doing. So you don't have professional historians until the, the 1800s. Of course, another thing um, we haven't talked about yet is the Protestant Reformation. And again, you can 
just look at this word. So these are people who are protesting against the Catholic Church and they broke away. And again, you can see the re here, which is again, and then form. So it's a reformulation of the church and many of the people who are breaking away from the Catholic Church were named Protestants because they were protesting. Again, they're going away from Catholicism. And what you get um, because of this is um, another look at church history. Maybe critical isn't quite the best word for it because Catholic historians are certainly taking a critical look at their own history. But Protestants uh, forced a new look at church history because they didn't trust the Catholic view. So you get a lot of new um, histories of ancient Christianity during this period. And of course, uh, right after the Protestant Reformation, you've got the Enlightenment, Scientific Revolution. Um, these things were teaching people to look at things rationally, scientifically, without focus on the church. And I put here um, the focus of a lot of um, histories that were written during this period were on human events and not God. So you, you see how um, things have changed over time in terms, of, in terms of religion and the use of divine, where early Greek history, you've got the gods and goddesses uh, moving people around like chess pieces. By the time you get to Thucydides and Trotitus, that they're moving further away from the divine controlling things. Uh, you see this in the Roman period as well. However, with the early Christians, they are right back with God controlling pretty much everything. By the time you get to the Renaissance and Reformation, once again, you're moving away away from that. Um, another thing that came out of, especially the Protestant Reformation, is a new division of time. So <laughs> historians um, now divided time in terms of uh, antiquity, which was an older period. Uh, you've got the Middle Period or the Middle Ages or the Medieval Period. And then for, for historians, I'm just going to put now. Um, and of course, for the Renaissance, it was during the Renaissance and so on. Um, but people who are writing during this new period considered it to be a new age. And this is the area um, that used to be called, I don't know if I can write with this, the Dark Age. I can write on my screen. Yeah, The Dark Age. Uh, people don't call it that anymore because it's not quite totally dark. But um, this was a period that... Um, a lot of historians skipped over because there wasn't a lot known. So you had to focus on the classical world and a focus on modern history. And then, of course, one big thing that's happening during this particular period is the discovery of the new world. So uh, just imagine that we discovered a new continent with 10 million people on it uh, with languages, religion, culture, and so on. Um, how do you think this would change our view of history? For the people living during the Protestant Reformation and the late Renaissance period, um, they had to really think about this. Like, how did all of these new people fit into ecclesiastical history? They weren't Christians. They had no introduction to Christianity whatsoever. Um, you also have to wonder how it fit into classical history because these people were unrelated to the classical world and they had their own cultures, their own archaeology, and so on. This caused a massive shift in of course, a lot of thinking, but in particular about how to write history. Uh, the final thing that I want to mention here that was happening that really affected the writing of history from the Renaissance period right up to the middle of the 1900s is something called textual criticism. So what textual criticism is, as I put up here, um, after the, the rediscovery of Greek and Latin text, it was discovered that we now had multiple copies of a single, te single text, say of the New Testament. Um, and there were differences found, no big surprise. So textual criticism helps historians to figure out what the original text might have said, at least according the best knowledge that we have. Um, and this is what textual criticism does. And what I've given you here to the left of the screen is a bit of the Greek uh, New Testament according to Matthew. And what you've got here is the Greek text according to what scholars think is the, the best one. And then you've got down at the bottom here, below the text, something called a critical apparatus. And what this is doing is it's it's talking about how uh, there are variations in the text and where you find these uh, variations, um, who might have these. So here you've got a man named Didymus, you've got Eusebius, a man named Epiphanius. And so 
what it's what a critical apparatus does is it shows the person who's reading the text that there are variations and it's up to the reader really to think about these different things anyway this is what contextual criticism is um, this got it started a little before Vala but Vala made it really popular because as you've read he was looking at the donation of Constantine which supposedly was written in the 300s by Emperor Constantine and um, based on his research, it really wasn't written until the late 700s, early 800s, and it's mostly because of language use and word use. So textual criticism usually tears a text apart word for word, uh, looks at the meanings, looks at the variations, and then tries to figure out what the original was.